Hello all. I'm a 28-year-old female, so this story is from years ago. Please enjoy reading this as much as I had sharing it. Let's just say my name is Jenna for the story's sake. I haven't been back to the same place since and I always shared this story with my friends. It has become a favorite, whether they believe me or not. This is somewhat of a throwaway account because I don't want to be pinned down to where I am. I usually visit my family's cottage up north, not going to disclose specifically where for privacy reasons, every summer and on the occasion on July 4th, Thanksgiving etc. It's a waterfront cottage, facing a lake, surrounded by a dense forest. It's located on a private beach, so you see your neighbor every once in a while. Everyone comes up north around the same time so it wouldn't be uncommon to have a chat with others and thus, everyone knows each other and subsequently, their business. My cottage sits between two others, one is inhabited quite frequently and one is abandoned, to my knowledge. My family and neighbors know that a European family, possibly Polish, German, etc., owns it. I just assume that they hold on to the property to maintain some sort of tangible asset in the United States. Back when I was young, around the ages of 18 to 20 my cousins, brothers, and I would get away from our family to smoke weed in the abandoned cottage to avoid any sort of scolding. It was fun, an empty cottage with some furniture that was a time capsule from the 80s. We would peer around and look at the old brown love seat, the dark den, the main living room adjoining the dining area and the cute little kitchen with old wine glasses laying around. It was resoundingly acknowledged that others have been through the abandoned cottage as well. There were smoke joints on the ground, footprints, old beer bottles with modern labels and furniture was always moved around from one position to another. However, the cottage was never spruced up, it was never clean nor organized. So we knew that the owners weren't coming by, it was random explorers, perhaps other teenagers, doing the same thing we did. Upon some curious investigation, we saw a basement, we opened the door and saw a staircase that led to a floor that was pure dirt, it looked like a cellar from what I could see. I stood at the top of the stairs looking down and saw exposed brick, nothing particularly interesting. Of course we would freak each other out saying someone lives down there, that there was a serial killer living there, or there was a corpse collection buried under the dirt floors. So, none of us would go down there with our independent conviction, it would have to have been a dare or a display of bravery. One day, around Thanksgiving, four of us, three girls, and my brother, went to the abandoned cottage to smoke some joints and gossip about family. I don't see my cousins much, only during special occasions, so we sat on the tables in the dining area to smoke, chill and chit-chat. Of course, the topic of the basement came up. We laughed and talked about who would go down there, who would most likely survive the serial killer living beneath us waiting for his next victim to enter his abode. We turned and noticed the basement was unlocked and this was unusual, since it was always locked. The one occasion where it was unlocked was when we took a look, or one of my brothers would go down there to freak all the girls out and prove his macho, so to speak. We would always lock it afterwards, purely out of the feeling of some sort of reassurance. We chalked it up to other teenagers just like us having visited the cottage before us, and all of us girls made my older brother get up and lock the door. He stood, looked us all up and down and jokingly said something along the lines of, You guys are just pussies, always get a man to do the scary thing for you. We laughed, but he was the guy, if there was someone down there, he would be the most likely to defend himself. He's a big guy, 210 pounds and 6 inch 5. He took maybe three steps before there was a knock, it sounded like a knock on a hollow surface. Considering that this cottage was quite old, I thought that it came from the side of the building. I don't think there's any significant insulation that would prevent an audible knock. I instantly looked at my brother, who looked smug. He said, You know, if you ask me to do something for you, don't mess with me whilst I'm doing you a favor. I looked around, waiting for one of the two other girls, my cousins, to fess up and mock his masculine courage. It seemed like everyone was resoundingly confused, anxious and waiting for the same thing. I guess my brother saw their reactions and did not see mine, and concluded that I was the source of the suspicious knocker since my back was turned to him. Very funny Jenna. You think you are such a joker. My brother said with a chuckle. I turned to him, and I guess he saw my anxious face as well. I guess he could read me well. I thought that maybe him walking on the old floors unsettled some of the structural integrity of the building. Maybe it was one of our parents messing with us. 
I didn't think it was from a foreign source. I quipped at him, just go and lock the door. He continued walking toward the door but it opened slightly, he stopped dead in his tracks immediately. We're going now, the hell with that freaking door, one of my cousins sternly said. We all got up from sitting on the tables, we gathered our things including weed, beer bottles, and phones. We quickly ran to the front door, not daring to look back. My brother was the last of the anxious conga line that was created by the bottleneck of the loan exit. I heard significant footsteps coming from the back of the cottage, I thought it was my brother, and I turned back and I swear to God I saw a hand opening the basement door. Oh my God! I yelled, there's someone in the freaking basement. I managed to shakingly say after running down the stairs that led to the front door. What? Everyone else said. My brother looked back, holy shit. He held onto the sides of my arms to push me to go faster. Go, we heard a foreign voice say. We ran faster, dropping bottles, pipes, and shoes. We ran so fast that our flip-flops flew off. I knew it wasn't any of us. Not even one of our parents, it was a low, stern voice from afar, my brother was right behind me. We made our escape to our cottage thoroughly flustered and terrified. There was a homeless guy in there, I freaking saw him. My brother out of breath, managed to say. I guess it was common knowledge that the place was abandoned, I wouldn't neglect the possibility of someone taking refuge there. I don't know if the guy went into the basement when he heard us coming then got tired of sitting on the dirt floor then scared us. I don't know. It's a private beach, so you would have to know of the specific location to be able to understand how to get there then also know that there's an abandoned property as well. I also know that there are squatters. To offer a further explanation, People share on Reddit that there are certain locations in our area where you could set up camp on a vacant lot and take a day to sit on the quiet beach. But I know that neighboring properties crack down on it pretty quickly and let them know that they can't settle there. I thought that would have been a good explanation. We ran to our parents after proactively hiding our wheat stash, our priorities are certainly well placed. And told them our story, they called the police and we watched from afar to see what the hell was going on. I guess the guy left. The police came to us and told us no one was in there, but they let us know to file some sort of report regarding the abandoned nest of the cottage. I think there are some sort of laws that demand that the owner should be using the cottage and executing upkeep. None of us really cared for being the Karens of the situation, so we never filed such a report. At the end of the day, I understand that some people just want to have assets, whether they're shitty or not. It would suck to lose out on good property in a nice location. I think they might come back one day since our neighbors know of the family. No one else has ever filed a report to my knowledge. I guess the experience didn't shake up my brother too much since he went back and gave me details. He found some dead squirrels and baby raccoons just laying in the living room. He said they looked quite fresh. I think that they died of natural causes but. How do two different species of animals just die in the same place? I asked him if they were mangled or obviously killed in some way and he said no. He said the baby raccoons had fur. I did some research and I know that baby raccoons aren't born with fur, so I deduced that they were alive for some time then somehow died in the living room. I don't want to know if something or someone killed them there. Or maybe killed them in another place and then brought them in there to give some sort of message to any oncoming visitors. I hope it isn't the homeless guy. I'm going to preface this by saying, I was incredibly naive. My best friend, Jay used to work at a restaurant in a very bad area, she had moved there from our little suburb about 35 minutes away. I still lived in the suburbs with my parents, so my street smarts weren't the best. This was three years ago, I was 19 at the time, so driving around to visit friends was, and is, one of my favorite pastimes. One day, I decided to stop by the restaurant to see Jay, as I'd done it a few times before and I was friends with all her co-workers. My friend was busy and she made me wait around with a few of the others for a bit until her break, then came to chat with me. At this time, I was very anti-purse and just kept a wristlet, a little wallet you can keep around your wrist. After chatting for about 30 minutes, I left the restaurant and walked back to my car. After driving for a while, I noticed I had left my wallet, so I texted Jay telling her to grab it for me and where I had probably left it. I already knew there was a possibility that it was gone being that I had left it in a busy restaurant in Center City, and Jay confirmed it was indeed gone. 
My dad canceled all the credit cards, but I was still holding on to hope that it would be returned, as I did have my ID in there. The next day, I got a text from Jay. She tells me someone called the restaurant and said they had my wallet, and that she had given them my number. I was really happy about this, but knew I would have to meet up with a stranger, so I decided not to tell my parents. I didn't get a text until the next morning. The person said that they had my wallet and wanted to give it back, but never have a name or description. I didn't care, I thanked them profusely, and asked when I could meet them. Hours later, they replied with an address and told me to stop by around 9 p.m. The address was about 20 minutes from the restaurant, which was also a really bad area but that didn't worry me as I had left my wallet right around there. I got there around 9, and this is when I started to get freaked out. The house looked like it was previously a row home, but the one connecting it to the rest had been demolished. The windows were boarded up, and there were no lights coming from inside. The place was obviously abandoned, grass overgrown, weeds everywhere, graffiti all over it, you get the idea. The door, however, was not boarded up and I could see it was ajar. I texted the number, and the person replied a second later telling me to come in. It was early summer, so while it wasn't completely dark out, was getting there and I would have needed a flashlight to see. So what do I do? Well, turn on my flashlight, of course. I get out of the car, and look around in hopes of seeing someone. Nothing. So with the phone flashlight in hand, I start walking up the dry rotted wooden steps to the front door. I crack the door open further. It's completely black, and when I shine my flashlight around, I can see there's no furniture. I thought I heard some quiet creaking from the upstairs, which I thought was strange. Why would the person text me to come in but then be hiding upstairs? At this point I knew there was something wrong here, I was scared as hell, and I hightailed it back to my car. I should have pulled around the corner but I didn't, I just called the police right there. Two policemen arrive shortly after, and walk right into the house with flashlights. Then two more pull up. They were inside for a long time, then they came out. With them, in handcuffs, are two skinny, scraggly, homeless looking guys. I only got a good look at one, but I do remember the guy had visible sores on his face and arms, I assumed they could be drug related. As the cops walked them by my car, one of the guys looked in at me with the angriest expression I've ever seen. Two of the officers came over to talk to me, and had indeed found my wallet inside. All the money was gone, but the rest was intact. The cops reprimanded me for being so stupid. I drove home and never spoke of it to my parents, only recently have I told them what happened. I'll never know what those guys were planning. Was it just someone messing with me, and I called the cops on two random homeless guys living there? I never got another text from that number. I started carrying a purse after that. Gross creepy abandoned house men, let's never meet again. Ever. I work in food service, front of house, so, in the early days of the pandemic with restaurants closed, I was taking work wherever I could find it. An old friend clued me into a medical office that needed someone to come in and do a bit of light filing. I was able to go in at night to limit direct contact with people, so I jumped at the opportunity right away. Ironically the medical office job had been the safest I'd gig been offered thus far, COVID-wise. I wanted to avoid the bus if I could, due to crowds, so decided to swing for a rideshare app. It's not all that expensive in my area and I really didn't want a virus. I headed in at almost 3 a.m. because it was after the cleaning crew had left. I was kicking myself for being so cautious, though, because I was exhausted. I stumbled onto the block looking for my ride and to my tired self's great relief the car spotted me almost immediately and pulled up asking, Uber? While I cluelessly wandered up and down the street searching. The ride was taking a while, but I'd only just moved here last year so I'm not familiar with all of the surrounding areas and thought nothing of it. I was pretty alert at first, so I was trying to pass the time playing games on my phone and stuff. But the car didn't have a compatible phone charger and I wasn't sure the building would have one, so I wanted to save my battery to be able to call a ride back. I shut my phone down into airplane mode and eventually drifted off from a combination of tiredness and boredom. I don't often take rideshares so being alone with a strange driver often put me a bit on edge but this guy had a pretty boring car and a very standard look about him, he looked a little like my brother even. Young, clean kept, listening to jazz, nothing that screamed you need to micromanage this trip. 
When we arrived the driver tried to wake me up by calling to me from the front but I was in too deep of a sleep and couldn't fully distinguish it from my dream. Finally he awkwardly jimmied my leg to wake me up and kept saying, Mayam, Mayam, we're here now. I was embarrassed that I'd gotten that out of it so I just hurriedly said, thanks, and booked it out of the car and into the building. As I looked around I began to realize nothing was what I had expected of an office park. I had seen a street view of the building when I first looked up the business and it had appeared to be a strip mall plaza. The further I went the more loudly alarm bells were ringing in my gut. The structure was semi-dilapidated and it was pitch black dark past the entryway. I expected some lights to be off in the nighttime, but not to the whole building. I skittered across the concrete foundation comprising what was left of the lobby area, told myself they must just be renovating, and followed signs for the stairs. After what felt like ages but was likely just a few minutes, all I had passed was construction equipment, a couple locked doors, and some smashed windows. I was certain I was not going to find a medical office and figured maybe I had mixed up the address. I took out my phone to double check, but once I got it out of airplane mode, I could barely get a signal. I kept moving around in the building, pacing, looking for a stronger signal. I eventually confirmed in my text that I had written down the correct address just by scrolling back, which didn't require service. Since I had only been inside for a few minutes at most, I figured I should try and get in touch with the driver, because if I entered the correct address then it was only fair he should continue my ride to the correct place and save me the added fees of calling a second trip, considering this was all his mix-up. The app was taking forever to load with my slow service, but before I could get to a cloud of reception. I heard a rustling sound in the lower level of the building. I was on the top floor and the only stairwell I was aware of was the one I had taken up, so it would force me into the middle of the building. There was no way to exit the situation without encountering whoever was downstairs. In an abandoned building in the latest hours of the night I figured the chances were high that it was a tweaker, and I had no desire to try slipping past a tweaker, especially when it was late enough that they were probably on something, so jumpy and on edge. I tried to get a text out to a group of friends with my address and a request to call 911 to help get me from the property because I didn't feel safe walking in that neighborhood at night and didn't have enough reception to call a new ride but the message wasn't sent. Reception was too weak. So I gave up on getting my phone going and started checking for another stairwell, or even a window with balconies or dumpsters that could be used to exit the second floor as a last resort, in the event whoever was downstairs came upstairs. I scrambled over to a door with a stairs sign on it, but the stairs were completely dilapidated and it was essentially just a straight drop down to the first floor. At that point the worst case scenario began to unfold. I heard whoever was downstairs begin making their way up the stairs. I thought fast and figured based on my walk about the floor was basically a giant loop, so I would have to wait for whoever this was to come up the stairs, wait for them to come all the way up and then sprint the opposite direction of wherever they were going and try to get down the stairs and out of the building in time to make it to the road without encountering them. I was not anticipating being chased or anything, but didn't want to piss off a druggie or have a homeless person who might be living there feel as though I trespassed and become hostile towards me, or have any sort of interaction that could possibly occur at that hour in an abandoned industrial park. I held my breath for what felt like 5 minutes but was likely closer to just 30 seconds and the person appeared at the top of the stairs. To my great relief, it was just the Uber driver. I figured he had come back from me, realizing he had left me in the wrong spot, a place that could have worked out to be dangerous. So I came out from the beam I was hidden behind and started to wave him down. But then I processed there was no way for him to realize this had been the wrong address. My stomach lurched forward and my blood chilled to slush. I made eye contact with him very briefly and he was completely calm and composed, but breathing pretty heavily, and blocking the stairwell down. On a normal, rational, day as an outside observer I could think of a dozen innocent reasons he might have returned, but in the moment, standing across from him, I just knew in my gut that this was someone with ill intent. I can't remember much more from the ensuing few minutes. Operating solely on muscle memory and instinct I superman dove for the second stairwell's opening and just let myself fall down the drop. Thankfully I don't think he'd seen where I'd gone at first, and though I was in too much pain to know it then, plenty was bruised but nothing was completely broken. I scrambled up and threw myself at anything that seemed like it could be the door. It was too dark to tell, I was disoriented from the fall, 
and I wasn't in a calm enough mindset to think to use my phone flashlight. Plus, in hindsight, some part of me probably knew it would call too much attention to my location. Just before I was able to reach the door, it flew open with the blinding light beaming straight into my eyes. My first thought, though not totally coherent, was, there's another one of these guys, A-A-H-H. And I stumbled backwards, trying to find something to hide behind. Before I could, a voice called out, all right, this is the name of town police department, everyone get on your knees with your hands in the air. I didn't believe it was the police at first. I was in such a fight or flight mode and had already committed to flight that I continued looking for ways to get out. But he kept shining the flashlight right at me as I teetered around and yelled, hey, I sat on the ground right now. Hands out, hands out where I can see them. He sounded so authoritative that I just automatically did exactly as he asked. He approached me and finally shined the light away from me. It took a second to get my night vision but once I did I could see he was really a police officer. I tried to explain what was happening but first he started asking me all these questions and that, combined with what had just happened, and my fear of the driver coming back, all snowballed into my being unable to form a single articulate sentence. He was even asking easy questions like, can you tell me your name? Do you have any knives, needles, or anything that could poke or cut me? Would you rather talk here or outside? And my total stunned babbling in response at first led him to believe I was onto something. He directed me out to his car, and once I was safely out of the building, I was able to start getting my bearings just a little. I sat on the edge of the back seat of the squat car, with the door open facing out, while he stood across from me and asked the same questions again. The first thing I could think to ask was, did my friends call you? What did they tell you? And he explained no, nobody called him. He was patrolling the area and noticed a car idling outside of this building that's known to be condemned, and nobody's supposed to be inside, and, when they are, they're not up to no good. He was launching into a speech about how if I'd gone to shoot up or meet a John he had resources he could direct me to and that this was not an ideal place to do either of those things and asking if I had somewhere safe to stay that night. But I was stuck on something else he'd said. Finally it all clicked. The car. I spilled my whole rideshare story in a frantic word vomit. He looked around and the car wasn't there anymore. The officer guessed the guy had driven off while we were talking inside the building. He asked me all the details I remembered and I told him, but there weren't many. I'd been too tired when the ride started to track much. But the officer realized I could pull up my Uber app and get all the information. There wasn't really enough reception there, even outdoors so we sped down the road and once I had enough bars the app roared to life and I had four missed notifications from Uber. They said, hello, I've arrived. And, I don't see you. Can you confirm the pickup address is correct? And, I'm flashing my hazards. And finally, unfortunately your driver had to cancel. At first I thought the driver was so cunning as to pick me up while sending these fake messages and canceling so the GPS wouldn't track us knowing I wouldn't notice because I was asleep with my phone off and exonerating himself. But instead I checked the car details, checked again, and it was definitely not the same driver. The person who'd driven me there had not been my Uber. My driver was somewhere else on the street when this guy pulled up to me. The policeman took my statement and said they would keep an eye out for the guy, but the best I could give them to go off of was basically young-looking Caucasian man with brown hair, sideburns, goatee, and four-door sedan, wearing a zip-up sweatshirt. Maybe I had a hood, which is, like, one out of every four guys in this city. I feel so blessed to have survived this near miss. Suffice it to say, I do not take rideshare services anymore. Quadruple check your license plate and driver name. You just never know.